Welcome to Bridgetown Church of Christ. We're glad you're here. You may be joining us in person or online. In person is an awesome option because it allows you to be with others and to serve others. Online is a solid option because there are times you just can't come to a building. You can still connect with your church family. No matter the format, we believe that God wants to speak to you. At BCC, we not only value you as an adult, but we value your children as well. On Sundays during our in-person service, we offer programming in Bridgetown Kids for children birth through fifth grade. Each Sunday, children will worship, they'll sing, they'll play games, they'll meet and make new friends, and they'll learn a story from the Bible in a fun and interactive and age-appropriate way. Our children's ministry space is bright, it's colorful, it's clean, and it is staffed by trained and background-checked volunteers. If you haven't brought your children to BCC, we really hope that you'll do so soon. We also want to invite your teenage students to join us in person. If you have students in 6th through 12th grade, they will head off to the Bridgetown Church Student Ministry Space where they will play games and receive dynamic teaching that applies directly to their lives before rejoining the adults for worship, for the singing, and for community life. Every Sunday, adults and youth and children will hear the good news about Jesus. They will learn that there is a community of people who love them and who care about them. And then we're all sent out to spread the love of Jesus to people around us. But here at BCC, we, we don't wanna just send you out once a week empty-handed. We exist to love our community and invite them into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And one of the primary ways that we can help you and, and really help our church to accomplish its vision is to equip you and your family with tools so that you can talk about God and you can talk about Jesus inside of your home no matter what stage your family is in. So every Sunday we publish three different family worship videos for you to use throughout the week. Each of these videos will give you a taste or a refresher of what's being discussed in Bridgetown Kids, in BCSM, or in the adult service. And each of the videos ends with some questions and some Bible reading so that you can talk about God inside of your home. We encourage you to check these out by visiting our church website. As for now, it's time to get things started. Good morning, church. Please stand. Let's sing together.
Growing up in a very small town in Indiana, we often had to come up with ways to entertain ourselves. And when I was in junior high and high school, one of our primary ways of entertainment was to play the silly little game, Have You Ever? And so we would gather together, sometimes standing in a parking lot, sometimes sitting in a living room, and we would ask each other the question, you know, have you ever held someone's hand? Have you ever kissed someone? Have you ever, whatever the question may be, and a lot of times the answer brought other questions with it. And I know for many of our students, they're preparing to go back to school here in the next week or two. Uh, summer, as we know it, as far as the school year calendar is concerned, is coming to an end. So I thought it would be fun for us to play a, an adult version of Have You Ever together as a church, okay? Now, I promise I'm not going to ask you any questions that will get you in trouble with your spouse, all right? That's my word to you. But I just want to ask you, have you ever, and if you have, raise your hand, or if you're joining us online, you can hit the like button or you can make a comment in the comment section. So first, have you ever changed the oil in your car or had the oil in your car changed? Raise your hand if you've ever changed oil or had it changed. All right, most of us. How about have you ever mowed your yard or paid somebody to mow your yard? Eh, pretty much everybody. Have you ever fixed something in your house or apartment? Have you ever just had to fix something that was broken? Okay. How about this? Have you ever gone to the doctor for a physical? Have you ever done that? Some, some of us, most of us, not everybody, but uh, have, have you ever deposited money in a bank account or credit union? You ever made a deposit of money? Okay, good. Now we know who has money. Okay, that's great. Um, how about this? Uh, have you ever resealed your driveway or had your driveway resealed? It's an asphalt driveway. Yeah, most of us, you may have noticed if you're joining us in the room today, when you came into the parking lot, we had it freshly sealed and striped this week. It looks great. It's something we have to do every couple years just as a maintenance item here at the church. Uh, one more question. Have you ever gone to the dentist for a teeth cleaning? Anyone ever gone and got your teeth cleaned? Or if you're joining us from Kentucky, got your tooth cleaned? Anybody out there? Um, <laughs> I know, somebody's going to leave the church, and I'm going to get a nasty email over that one, but it was low-hanging fruit. I couldn't, I could not do that. So uh, the, now let me kind of tweak the question a little bit. How many of you really enjoy those things? How many of you love changing the oil in your car, mowing your yard, going for a physical, saving money, sealing your driveway, or getting your teeth cleaned? You're just like, those are the things I really, I've got a couple of people that are like, hey, most of those things I like to do. But by and large, we don't enjoy those things because they're just maintenance items. You know, I talk to people every week, and I've never had someone say to me, when I say to them, hey, what are you going to do this week? I've never had someone respond and say, I am so excited because I get to have a physical this week. Like, it is the highlight of my month. I cannot wait to get to the doctor for that physical. But we all know that our cars and our bodies and our teeth, they just need some TLC from time to time. And so we do maintenance items. But here's my question. I wonder if on occasion we bring that attitude into our relationship with God. Do we treat our relationship with God as a maintenance issue? Do, do we treat our relationship with God as a maintenance issue? We perform a once-a-week checkup to make sure everything's running smoothly, maybe kind of out of obligation. Like getting our teeth cleaned, we occasionally will ask a friend, hey, do you see anything in my life, a way in which I'm not honoring God? But, but kind of like with our mechanic, if they say something that we don't like, we just find a different mechanic because we don't want to actually deal with the problem. Is it sort of like our bad habits or weeds? And, you know, every once in a while, we'll cut down that part of the yard, but most of the time, it just kind of grows, and it's a maintenance issue that we would just as soon not pay a lot of attention to. BCC friends and family, I believe God wants so much more for our life. He wants a relationship with us that's not just about maintenance and obligation, but is instead about love and friendship. 
And I just want to say that we're glad you're here at Bridgetown. We're going to be talking today about this idea in particular and how it ties to the area of stewardship. But first, I just want to say hello to the folks that are joining us online. It's been a little while since I've said hi. And so out of curiosity, I looked back to see who checked in online last week. And so let me say hello to the Niemeyer family, to Betty Anderson, to Bob and Charlene, who I saw here today, uh, to Paul and Dorothy Fisher, Jim and Jan Stewart, Larry and Karen, Kathy, Marty and Ruthie, Tom and Jane, Anna and Dick, Wendy, Jeannie. You all checked in with us online last week, and we appreciate that. For those of you who checked in here today, thank you for taking the time to just stop by the Gateway team and let them know you're here. Uh, it's one thing we do that's very simple and very small because we don't want you to fall through the cracks here at Bridgetown. We don't want to be a church where people can just come and, and then disappear and we never know it. I was thinking about this week, and I thought I should develop a, a, a slogan. So here's what I came up with. Check in if you're here so we know if you disappear. Do you like that? Check in if you're here. Check in if you're here so that we know if you disappear. That's, that's the slogan we're going to use. You can probably come up with something better. If you do, let me know what it is, and we will tweak it going forward. But that was the best I could come up with. Really, we're glad that you are spending your Sunday with us. It's great to have you here. Last week was a vision Sunday, and we talked about our vision as a church, which is to love our community and invite them into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. I saw that vision in action right after church. Uh, Jonathan, our new worship guy, uh, I mentioned in passing that he was going to be relocating to the area, and he told me this week that he had six different families come up to him and say, hey, um, if you need a place to stay, then you are welcome to stay with me. And I, I just love that. So can we just give our church family a hand? Um, I don't know exactly what his plans are yet, but I love that level of hospitality. The, so many people in our church family would say, hey, we're here to welcome you into this place. I talked to Alan this week. Alan's one of our church partners, and he also serves as a uh, select soccer coach. And I talked to him this week, and he said, Nathan, when you were asking me or us as a church to consider how we can live out the mission, what I couldn't keep but thinking about is how when I used to be in youth soccer, we would pray before every game. And he said, I'm going to start having a team prayer with my team before every game because I want the kids in select soccer to know that they can talk to God anywhere and that he cares about everything that's happening in their lives, even if it's just a soccer game. And I love that. I love to hear stories of how our church partners are saying, hey, how can I live out the mission of this church right where I'm at? So keep it up. I look forward to hearing more stories. At BCC, as for today's message, we believe that the discipleship pathway involves giving generously and regularly. Giving is something that helps us to grow in our relationship with God. Giving generously and regularly falls under the heading of stewardship. But before I define stewardship for you, I just want to tell you a story from the Old Testament about stewardship. It comes, interestingly, from the book of Genesis. Genesis is the book of beginnings. It's this fascinating story in which we read about the beginning of humanity. Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, the first city, the first civilization and God is creating and setting things up. And what happens in the book in Genesis uh, provides the foundation for everything else that's going to happen throughout the rest of Scripture. This holds true of the good things and the things that are outside of the will of God. See, the book of Genesis holds no punches. We learn of sin and rebellion and jealousy. Very early on, we see this moment of stewardship that kind of goes south very quickly. Adam and Eve, they make themselves a choice. And their choice is to do something that's outside of the will of God. As a result, they are put out of the garden. And the whole rest of the story, including our story, is people trying to get back to God. And we try all kinds of different ways to do that. The good news of the New Testament, the good news of the Bible, is that the one way for us back to God is through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And that's where the whole arc of the story of the Bible goes. That everything that happens is about us getting back to God through Jesus and what he has done on the cross. But as for the story of Adam and Eve, they go on to have two sons, Cain 
and Abel. But their story is far from idyllic. It's not the perfect story of a husband and wife and 2.1 kids and a little puppy living on a cul-de-sac. That's not exactly how the story goes. Here's what we read in Genesis chapter 4. Now, Adam knew his wife Eve. Whenever the Bible says someone knows somebody, often that's sexual. And so he had sex with his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. It's pretty cool. The name Cain means possession. And so Eve literally says, okay, I have a possession, I have a son, but I know that this son is only mine and is only possible because of who God is. And so she receives this possession. Let's continue on in the story. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain worked a uh, worker of the ground. Now Abel, the name Abel means breath. And there's a couple of different ways to look at this. The one hand, he is the person that helps take care of breathing things. He's a shepherd. He deals with sheep. He deals with animals. Whereas Cain is in agriculture. He deals with growing things. But there's also a clue hidden in the name Abel. Breath or vapor gives us an indication this guy is not going to be around for long. His life on this earth is going to be very short-lived, and we're just not sure what that's going to look at. So let's keep going. Now look like, let's keep going. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Hang on to that because it's important. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his, his offering, he had no regard. And so Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said, Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, we not be accepted. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. When we read this story, we're struck by how extreme it is. We go from the garden, we go from this idyllic moment of God walking with Adam and Eve, and we go straight from the garden and into this moment of death, of Cain and Abel and this death that occurs. And we, we wonder, like, how is this possible that that sort of thing can happen so quickly? But at the same time, we know how quickly sin can run amok in our life. A little bit goes a long way. And when we give over to sin, it can make a mess really quickly. Also, for those of you with young kids at home, like me, I have four young children at home, um, you realize how quickly brothers can fight one another, right? Or brothers and sisters. So this idea of a brother and a brother uh, getting into an argument and killing each other, that's not too far-fetched, is it? I mean, we're, we're kind of looking forward to school going back because we've seen this playing out inside of our own homes. But all this does raise the big question, what is it that causes God to regard Abel's offering and not to regard Cain's offering? Why is it God says, I have regard for Abel's offering, but I have no regard for Cain's offering? There has to be more to the story than God just doesn't want his vegetables that day, right? There, there has to be something else going on in the story. So what is it that's happening in the story? Well, we're going to get there as we look through it today. And we're going to answer that question. For starters, it's worth noting that both sons just know to bring an offering to God. Did you notice that both sons just know to bring an offering to God? This is really early on in the story of humanity. It's before the Old Testament is written. It's before the law is given. It's in the beginning, and yet they both know to bring an offering to God. Why? What is it that clues them in? The only answer that makes sense is that Adam and Eve, mom and dad, had to have taught their children the importance of bringing an offering 
to God. Why? Why would they bring an offering to God? Stewardship. At its most basic level, stewardship is taking care of someone else's stuff, whether it's an organization or a place. It's a work ethic that embodies a response in which we say, I'm going to care for what I have. Maybe that's changing the oil in your car. Maybe it's getting your teeth clean. But it's saying, hey, I am going to take care of the valuable things that I possess. And Adam and Eve must have taught their children at a very young age that everything belongs to the Lord. I can just kind of picture it. It's not in the Bible, but my mind starts to run with the story that Adam's out with his young son, Cain, and they're getting ready to plant some seeds in the ground. And Cain says, hey, where did these seeds come from? And Adam says, let me tell you about God who created everything. And yes, we have to work the ground, and yes, we have to plant the seed, but all this is possible because of God. He makes the sun rise. He makes the rain come. He gives us everything everything we have, and we respond to him out of what we have been blessed with. Maybe it was with Abel, and they're out in the stably areas, and, and it's a young calf being born, and perhaps the whole family is gathered around, and, and Adam just uses that teachable moment to say, hey, Abel, you know, this, this calf is possible. The breath is possible because God creates and God provides. And maybe Eve steps up and Eve says, hey Abel, remember your name means breath because you have been given your breath by God. And and the family just is constantly aware of God's presence and how he has provided for them in so many ways. They knew that everything is God's. And I wonder, do you believe that truth? Do you live with an awareness that everything you have belongs to God? Your house, your pets, your car, your investment accounts, that everything you have belongs to God. That was the foundation upon which they raised their family. And it was so real for them, I think, because Adam and Eve were there. They saw so much of the early creation of God. And so they shared that with their kids. The simplicity led to a response, and the response was an offering that was later built into the sacrificial system. Here's what we read in the book of Deuteronomy which is the law. So what happens in Genesis gets kind of locked in in Deuteronomy. And this is what we read. And behold now, I bring the first of the fruits of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me, and you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. God wanted the first of what they had, the first of the fruit. It was important in the Old Testament law, and it was important in the story of Cain and Abel. Why did God accept Abel's offering, and why did God reject Cain's offering? I think the answer is because Abel brought the first and the best, and Cain did not. Here's what the story says, and it's so easy to miss. It says, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. It's really subtle, but the difference is really, really big. I was talking about this passage this week with a couple guys in the church, and Tim Krause was there. And Tim said, you know, it's kind of like Abel um, came with a really thoughtful gift, and Cain showed up with a gift card. And I said, yeah, that's kind of that's like what's going on in the passage. See, the Bible doesn't say anything about Cain's offering other than he brought some fruit. But it says a lot about Abel's offering. It says he brought the firstborn of his flock. Why does that matter? Because if you have one baby cow, what's to guarantee you're going to have another baby cow? Nothing. If you have one baby sheep, what is to guarantee you're going to have another baby sheep? Nothing. And so when Abel shows up and he says, this is the first of what I have. This is the very first of what is born to me. It is a very powerful way in which he's saying to God, you know what, God, even though there's no guarantee that anything else will come, I am going to trust you with the first of what I have because I believe you will provide everything else I need with my life. And that's exactly what Abel does. It's this powerful Mormon. What about the whole idea of the fat portion? Let me talk food with you for a minute because I love to eat. Um, I, I like to grill. Now, I know some of you are vegetarians. That's all right. God loves you anyway. But I am a meat-a-tarian. I love meat. My meal starts with meat, and then you build around that. And um, I like to grill. 
but it's really easy to dry out hamburgers. There's nothing worse to me than a dried out hamburger. It's like chewing on a piece of shoe leather. So years ago, I learned this trick from a cooking show that I still use to this day. I put one tablespoon of quick oats into a pound of hamburger that I make into hamburger patties. Why do I put quick oats in my hamburger? Because the oats soak up the fat while it grills so that the fat doesn't just drip out of the hamburger. Because what makes the hamburger so good? good is the fat in the hamburger, right? That, that's what makes it really, really good. And so for me, it just makes it so much juicier and better. If you give me a choice between a piece of meat that has beautiful marbling on it and a piece of meat that doesn't, I'm going to choose the one with the fat in it every single time because the fat is where the flavor is. Here's the deal. Abel says, I want to give my best to God. When I kill this animal, I get to keep some of it for myself, but I want to give the absolute best pieces to God. That's why scripture tells us he gave the fat portions to God. See, God has always deserved the first and the best because everything is his in the first place. The attitude that is behind Abel and Cain is very different. Cain says, well, let, me, let me pick something along the way. Let me grab a few tomatoes. Maybe here's a pear, and I'll give that to God. And Abel says, no, you know what? I'm going to give the first of what I have. I'm going to trust God to provide the rest. I'm going to give the best of what I have. And that is what pleases God because God has created, and everything is his in the first place. And God loved it, and he built it into the law system. Now, naturally, what we bring to God has changed. Most of us don't show up to God, don't show up to our church family with, um, with grain and with meat. Most of us are paid now with cash or check or some sort of an electronic investment, and God asks that we return the first and best of what we have to Him. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed from that time until now. In fact, time and time again throughout the Bible, this is reiterated. In the book of Malachi, the people of God are struggling to bring their best to God, and God uses the prophet to say this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. It's the only time in the whole of Scripture God says, test me, and see if I do not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Test me, God says. And I'll show you, I'll prove to you that I own everything. Test me. Bring your tithe in. Bring your 10% and see what it is that I am able to do. Why? Because we're responding as an act of worship to God. His love and his goodness puts us into the place where we do that. Man, I wish we could see the world the way Adam and Eve saw it. I wish we could look at the sunrise the way Adam and Eve looked at the sunrise and know God created that. I wish we could look at our landscaping the way they looked at the bushes outside of the garden and say, God made those things for me. I wish we could look at animals with that kind of awe that Adam and Eve had to have had in their eyes that they passed on to their kids that led, at least for Abel, to a heart of worship. You know, used to, I hated talking about giving in church because there was always kind of some pushback, and I didn't like to discuss it. I always hoped that I'd be on vacation the week that we had a stewardship Sunday. But I have to tell you now that I actually enjoy talking about this, because I have personally experienced what it's like to receive the regard of God. I want to share just a little bit of my story with you. Uh, when Nikki and I got married 18 years ago, we actually celebrated 18 years of marriage this week, which is proof that there, yeah, that's for Nikki, not for me. That hand is for Nikki, uh, my wife, who has put up with me for 18 years. It's proof that miracles still happen on this earth. And um, when we got married 18 years ago, she said, Nathan, we're going to tithe. We're going to give 10% of our income to God. And I said, yes, ma'am. And um, that started our marriage out, and we have stuck with that all the way through. And it is amazing the way God has provided for us. Again, I don't want to share too much, but I will just tell you this. Uh, Nikki and I have primarily been a single-income family. And as long as something unforeseen doesn't happen, our full intention and goal is to be debt-free by the end of next year. That includes our house. We are down to just our house debt. And that, that round of applause is not for me. That's for God. God has provided for us 
time and time again. I cannot tell you how much. And, and here's what happens. People look at that and say, hey, you know, Nathan, that's, that's just you. But, but here's the thing. I think God's promise to test him goes to all of us. I see Jay Hall sitting back there. Jay's one of our church partners. And he said to me a few years ago, he said, Nathan, you keep teaching people about tithing because it is the best choice my family has ever made. And I know that that's true for so many of us. When we put God first in this area, God opens the doors for us to his full blessing. We just have to take the step of faith. It's so hard for us, though, because we say, man, I want to hold on to this. And Abel says, no, you know what? I'm going to trust you, God, and I'm going to see what you do. And God has regard for Abel. Now, I know when I talk about stuff like this that one of the rubs is, quite frankly, sometimes husbands and wives aren't on the same page when it comes to this. Sometimes there's one person in the relationship that says, hey, I want to give, and there's somebody in the relationship that says, hey, I don't think we should do that, and, and, and it really can cause some, some issues inside of the home. And, and beyond that, I know that there is a, a real struggle in a lot of homes right now. Uh, a friend of mine commented this week that they don't even like to get on Facebook anymore because they feel like every time they get on Facebook, they see another person who's going through a divorce. And I've experienced a lot of that myself just this past week. Two people that I graduated high school with posted on Facebook that their divorces have finalized. Marriage is hard. It's very, very hard, and that's why I'm really excited to tell you that on September the 26th from 5 to 7.30 here at Bridgetown, we are going to host a healthy marriage event. This event is in partnership with Rock Solid Families, and we want to give families the tools they need in order to improve their marriage. And so if you go to bridgetownchurch.com forward slash next, you can click on the tab there and register for the event. Your registration includes uh, a meal that's being carried catered by a catering company out of Cheviot. It includes child care. There's an opportunity for your teenagers to serve if you have teenage children, and especially if they're working to get some service hours, there's an opportunity for them to do that as well. It's all right there through the next tab. But I'm super excited for us to have this event as a church and to be able to see marriages strengthen. Uh, you'll notice when you get there, you can register as a single person or as a couple. If you're not, if you're not married, um, you're welcome to come. The principles, the tools that will be taught will be helpful no matter what. I was joking with the counselors. We were talking about this upcoming event, and, uh, and the counselor said, we want to give tools to every family so that they can succeed. And I said, well, in my family growing up, we had tools as well. We had a stick of dynamite and a shovel because when something bad happened, we blew up, and then we covered it up, and we moved on. Those were our tools. And um, um, it wasn't overly healthy all of the time. Every family has tools. We want to give you the right tools so that you can have a successful marriage. And so that event is coming. I wish, again, I could share with you every way that God has provided for us over the years, my wife and I. But I'll tell you this. When I read that passage, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, I have just experienced the regard of God time and time again. This idea that's built into the story of Cain and Abel, that is put into the law in the book of Deuteronomy, that is spoken about by Malachi in the Old Testament prophets, it shows up again in the New Testament. There we read this. The point is this, Paul says, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each person must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. These words are written to a city named Corinth, which was a wealthy port city. The people in Corinth were quite wealthy, and yet they had a really hard time giving. And so Paul wrote to them and said, here's the point, folks. If you sow sparingly, guess what? You're going to reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, guess what? You're going to reap bountifully. Don't do it reluctantly or with compulsion because God loves a cheerful heart. When we have a stewardship Sunday here at Bridgetown, it's not my goal or intention to twist your arm or to force you into giving, not reluctantly or under compulsion. 
It's simply my hope that you'll see Scripture for what it is and that you'll know that there is a reason for us to worship God. And one way we worship God is by giving generously regularly. When we do that, we allow God to be in our lives. And so my challenge for you this week is this, to take a step towards giving generously regularly. I don't know what that step is for you. Maybe you need to start tithing. Maybe it's something you did in the past and you don't do any longer. Maybe it's something that you've just gotten away from or you've never tried. I promise you that if you do that, God will show up in your life. He says, test me. And when God says something, he means what he says. So take a step of faith and see if he doesn't throw open the floodgates of heaven to bless you in ways you never expected before. Take God at his word and take a step of faith. Let me go back for just a moment to this whole idea of maintenance that I talked about early on in the message today. I fear sometimes we carry the maintenance mentality into our relationship with God, and especially in the area of giving. It's like, you know, God, I will give because this is what you asked me to do. It's like a maintenance thing, and it's not a relationship thing. I talked to a woman this past week who recently lost both of her parents, And she said to me, her parents were older, she said, Nathan, I would give anything to be able to take them to the doctor again. Now, she wasn't saying that because she wants her parents to be sick. She was saying that because while at the time it was kind of a pain to take her parents to the doctor, she misses that time she has with her parents. And it got me thinking. You know, when I have to take my kids to the dentist or to the doctor, or whenever I help my children out with those maintenance tasks, I I don't think about them the same way because I I do it out of love and I do it out of the relationship that's there. It's not about obligation. It's about the fact that I love my family. And I think that's the way this whole thing is supposed to work with God. If we put God first in this area of our lives, it helps God to, to be first in all areas of our life and we will reap bountifully the benefits of a life-changing relationship with Jesus, which is what we're all about as a church in the first place. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the story of Cain and Abel. I confess to you that at times I am much more like Cain than Abel. I don't give you the first and I don't give you the best in various areas of my life. Thank you for remaining faithful even when I am not. You deserve our worship, our praise, and our attention because everything is yours. Help us to give generously, regularly, so that we can receive all of the blessings you have in store for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to enter a time of which is open to all who believe in Jesus and have accepted him as Lord and Savior of their life. If you're with us in person, there's packets available on the back table. If you didn't grab one, you can go back there and get one right now. If you're joining us online, uh, you can use bread or crackers. You can use juice or water. What we use is not as important as what it is that we remember together. You know, as we enter communion this week, we, we kind of get to restructure a little bit. When we give regularly and generously to God, it does not affect our salvation. It's one of the ways we respond for what Christ has done for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So let's remember his extravagant act of love as we eat together. as you prepare to drink of the cup, I I just really encourage you not to look at your relationship with God as a maintenance issue. It's about love and not obligation. So let's drink together and remember the love of Jesus. You know, so often we look at what we have and that's what our focus is on what we worship instead of looking at the person who gives it to us and I hope today more than anything else as you walk away from here or as you log off in a few minutes from the church service the thing that's sticking out to you and and, and is really reminding you 
is that this is about God and His love for us. And so we're going to sing a couple songs. If you're able, please stand with us. And this is an opportunity for you to respond in some way, shape, or form. If you're joining us online, you might want to visit the next tab and respond by submitting a prayer request. For any of you, you may want to go to that next tab and register in order to come to the Healthy Marriage event on September 26th. I'm really excited about that event, and I encourage you, no matter what stage you are in your marriage, to take that in and and come and check it out. And if your spouse won't come with you, that's okay. You can come and, and get something out of it as well. It may be that you want to learn about Christian baptism, and we invite you every week to take that step, to learn what it is to die to your old life and raise to a new life with Christ. Whatever it is, this is your time to make a step of faith towards your relationship with Jesus. Let's worship Him together.
sing it one more time, just our voices. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great Thank you, Jonathan and band. Great job. Um, as Nathan has said uh, several times today, we are so glad that you are here today. Um, it was a choice that you had to make, and we're thankful for that choice. And we hope that you make the choice to come back next week. Um, last week, if you were here, I was up here. And um, every week we talk about the next. How many of you know about going to the next page on our website? How many of you went there this past week? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I am encouraging all of you again to check out the next tab on our website. Um, there are so many things that you can see um, and learn about on our website, but the next tab actually is a way that you can take your next steps. Um, maybe that's giving, maybe it's sending in a prayer request, joining a serving team, um, and a lot more can be found there. So please, I encourage you just, I'm not saying you, when you go and you click on it that you have to sign up for something, but just I encourage you to check it out to see what it's about for when the time comes that you have that nudge from God to make take that next step. Um, also on the next page is a sign up to be a part of a service event that BCC will be doing in partnership with Block Ministries. Uh, Nathan mentioned Block Ministries, um, I know, last week. Uh, Block Ministries is a local Cincinnati mission organization that works with local children, youth, families, men and women in a variety of ways, including um, they offer drug counseling, emergency housing, job training, and so much more. On Saturday, August 28th, BCC will partner with Block Ministries to serve others on the west side of Cincinnati. We'll be painting rooms and cleaning in a local boys' home. We will also be working on a fence, cleaning and installing and repairing doors in a local women's home. This is an event for kids, students, and adults to all be a part of. We will meet here at BCC at 8 o'clock in the morning and will return by 1 p.m. The event is free and lunch is provided. So stop by the next page to sign up for this opportunity to love our community. The past couple Sundays, you've no doubt seen that there is a uh, mountain of Gatorade, cases of um, Gatorade, as you walk through the door. The idea behind this is to offer a cold drink to someone that is thirsty. It's a free gift that BCC is giving out. Uh, this could be a parent um, or grandparent or guardian that's watching their son or daughter or grandchild at a youth event. Um, it could just be a neighbor that you see out on a walk or run. A sporting event is not the only way that you can use the Gatorade bottles. Um, if you want to put a case out in front of your house in a cooler with a sign that says free, take one, go for it. Uh, you can take it with you when you go to the park and hand it out to um, people at the park. You can take it to work and pass them out to coworkers. We bought the Gatorade and made stickers that say a free gift from Bridgetown Church. From there, it's really up to you and your creativity um, in how you use them. So on your way out the door, go ahead and grab a, um, an envelope with the stickers in it, and they are waterproof, and I haven't tested it, but I hope that that's pretty awesome. I didn't know they had waterproof stickers, um, so you can make sure that Gatorade is cold when you're passing it out. And um, so grab a, a case and give them out as a way to join us in our vision to love our community and invite them into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Uh, the last thing I want to say is a big thank you for all that you do and give to support the vision of BCC. Our partnership with Block Ministries, the Gatorade cases, um, giveaway are possible because of your financial gifts, and we are truly grateful for that. Whether you give regularly regularly, or from time to time, 
We appreciate it. If you'd like to give today, let me remind you that you can do so online at the church website, through the church app, or in the drop boxes on your way out the door. Thank you for being here today, and have a great week.